have a story today that is a little bit of East and West. So Singapore is a great place, I think, to tell that story. My own story begins in Chicago. So I grew up here uh, uh, in the Windy City. What they don't tell you is it is also quite cold. And so uh, as soon as I finished uh, neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience, I said, I'm getting out. I can't take the cold. And I went to California, which is a very, uh, very American thing to do. So uh, I ended up in San Francisco. This is sunny San Francisco, and that's the Pacific Ocean. It's a beautiful place. And uh, I got a job at Stanford doing uh, neuroscience work. And so what we were studying at Stanford is quite interesting, and uh, I want to share that with you. So uh, what we were studying is the brain, its structural and functional properties, and how it changes during different states of consciousness. Consciousness is kind of this awareness, this attention. It's what makes us human. It what's, it's what truly allows us to be us. And so from that sense, it's, a, it's quite a fascinating topic. But what's interesting is that neuroscience is only now starting to piece apart what exactly constitutes consciousness. And so the way that neuroscience does this is by looking at very extreme examples on the edges of what we know in uh, medical science and in the scientific world in general. One of those cases is epilepsy. People who have epileptic seizures often go through a, an aura before the seizure where they report an altered state of consciousness. And so we study that at Stanford very, very deeply, um, both with large magnets, uh, looking at the structural properties of the brain, and also directly on the surface of the skull uh, by putting electrodes onto the brain. Another uh, kind of edge case is uh, anesthesia. So you can imagine when you're going under anesthesia, many of you may have had a, an operation where you went under. What happens there? It's interesting, right? Your, uh, your body, many of your reflexes are still there, yet your consciousness, your awareness is gone. And so that's also an uh, interesting example where we can kind of dissociate consciousness and the regular body. And so we're getting at what is the basis of human consciousness? And then we came to a, a very interesting research study, and this was the start of my journey. What you're seeing here is a, is a Tibetan monk with a high-density EEG array on his head. And so what, what this is measuring, and although it looks quite strange, it's, uh, it's actually very innocuous, it's just measuring, it's not injecting anything or, uh, into his brain, but what it's measuring is the electrical activity of the brain as the monk goes through different states of consciousness. And meditation is kind of a training in this, and so we use meditation as a way to piece apart what was happening in the brain, and uh, the results were quite fascinating. So now this work has been replicated, this is actually from Richie Davidson's lab, in uh, the University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. But there are now many, many laboratories uh, across the world that are doing this, uh, doing this type of research. So what you see is on the left, the monk in the resting state, just sitting quietly with their eyes closed. At the very beginning, there's a, there's a sharp change in the brainwave activity. And that's when the monk starts to, starts to meditate. This is clear, incontroversible evidence that the brain is changing quite dramatically during the state of meditation. And this chart actually is what changed my life. Uh, I saw this and I, and I realized, wow, you can measure meditation. And since you can measure that state, this is potentially an avenue to understand our consciousness and develop tools to do so in a way that is um, easily accessible and also uh, perhaps useful to us. After several years in the, in the research world, I decided to, uh, rather than just study monks, to go live like them and, uh, and learn more about, uh, about their uh, meditation. And so I bought a one-way ticket to the Himalayan mountains. This is me in uh, Himachal Pradesh, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas in India. And uh, I went to a place called Dharamshala. Dharamshala is actually where the Dalai Lama lives in, uh, in India. And the Dalai Lama has instituted this whole kind of collaboration between neuroscientists and monks. It's kind of an interesting pairing, but uh, that's why I went here. And so I spent uh, almost nine months traveling through the mountains, meeting many types of monks. And uh, of course, I am a neuroscientist, so I took my brainwave equipment with me. And so I asked them to meditate. And, uh, and basically, we learned what meditation looks like in the brain. And we learned how to detect it and to quantify it and to, uh, to turn it into something uh, useful. And so that was my kind of right brain, my scientific bent, uh, understanding meditation. But then I realized, you know, actually, it's not enough to understand something, right? 
consciousness was so interesting originally because I wanted to feel something different. I wanted to understand my own mind and my own world in a different way. And just studying it rationally gave me nothing. And so I realized that I had to also uh, walk the walk. And so I ended up in Ladakh, which is in the remote part of the Himalayas. Uh, it's uh, a very isolated desert environment. And many monasteries have been there for thousands of years because, frankly, no one wants to live there. It's a, it's, it's a very terrible place, uh, yet quite beautiful. So, so, uh, so I ended up in Ladakh at a, at a monastery there. And um, I was wandering through the monastery, and I'll never forget this. Uh, it was around lunchtime. A lot of the monks were uh, eating. And there was one old monk kind of in the, just kind of ambling about in the middle of the courtyard. And I walked up to him. And uh, he speaks Tibetan and a, a small amount of Hindi. And I speak English and a small amount of Hindi as well. And so we tried to communicate, mostly in, unsuccessfully. And he kept pointing me to uh, this hill behind him. And I asked myself, what, what is he trying to say? And finally, I realized that what he was, what he was trying to tell me was that there was, a, there was a monastery behind the monastery, a hidden monastery, where uh, a lot of the meditation happened. And because I had my machines, he wanted me to go to, uh, to understand them and, uh, and meet them. So I ended up journeying behind this, behind this mountain. And uh, I found monks there who taught me to meditate. And they sent me to a cave. And I actually spent quite a lot of time uh, in that cave, meditating and, and doing the practices. and. Uh, drinking from a mountain stream, uh, eating bread and butter, quite, a, quite an austere and interesting experience, I think, especially coming from the States and from a, from a lab background. And, and to be honest, that, that experience taught me something very interesting about myself, that it is not enough to, to understand something, but you do have to feel it. And so with that knowledge in mind, I came back down from the mountain and ended up at Harvard and uh, the laboratory of Sarah Lazar. And she does amazing work um, measuring this kind of thing. And so uh, kind of from the lab to the mountain and back again. And what you're seeing here is meditation, of course, changes the brain, as, as I mentioned. But it does so in very specific ways, uh, quantifiable ways. So this is a cortical thickness in parts of the brain that are associated with empathy, understanding somebody else, um, associated with uh, self-regulation and executive attention. Now in America, uh, meditation has become very uh, vogue because executives use it, um, celebrities use it to increase their productivity. Of course, meditation has many benefits, and, and that's, that's one of them. And this is the reason why. It's changing your brain, and that's quite fascinating, actually. And so uh, I took some of the insights that I had gained from this whole process and made an app. Uh, so you can, you can download this uh, on, the, on the App Store. It basically uses an EEG headset and, uh, and your iPhone to help guide you through a, a series of meditations. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Let me show you a, a little example of how this technology can work. So what's happening is that the device that you wear on your head is measuring your inner state. It's almost like a very intuitive meditation instructor. And it's doing that in real time. So during your meditation, it can watch you. And if it notices that your mind starts to wander for five, six, seven seconds in a row, it can actually gently remind you to come back to your current awareness. And it does that in a very gentle way. Notice what's happening. Relax and gently reconnect with your breath. So this type of real-time neurofeedback is, is a very new technology and hasn't, hadn't really been done before. And uh, we released that to, to consumers and also found a way to apply it in the clinical space. So right now, this app uh, is being used in many hospitals across America. Uh, for people with chronic pain to teach them to use meditation without relying so much on drugs. And it's quite a powerful experience. Uh, I went to the hospital and uh, I met a young lady who had just come out of a meditation and she gave me a hug and she was crying. And it was such an incredible experience for, for her because these type of tools allow us to bring our own, um, our own mental power to bear on, a, on a something that often feels like uh, is out of our control. I think that's a lesson we can all learn. And so I kept exploring the heart. This is my friend Mikey and uh, some glasses that he made. Basically, these glasses have LEDs embedded in them, and they're monitoring his heartbeat from his ear and feeding it back to him in a constant uh, light LED pattern. It's kind of interesting, but quite odd. This is the process of invention, right? And so then uh, we, we tried putting something in the ear. Essentially, we wanted to find a way to make meditation from the signal from the brain or from the heart wearable and just totally, uh, totally discreet. And so we thought we'd put it in the ear. 
mocked it up. Uh, nobody wanted it. I live in Silicon Valley. We tried to pitch it to people. They said, get out of here. We're not giving you any money. So, uh, so that was a wash. And then, uh, as I mentioned, science is, science is funny. You, know, you never know where ideas come from. And uh, I was dating a girl at the time who was a nurse. She got up at like 4 a.m. in the morning, which is just the hospital, right? It's terrible. And, uh, and woke me up. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, I went back to bed, got up a few hours later. And uh, I saw that she had her stethoscope on the, on the desk. And I've been looking at the heart, you know, all these different ways. And so I put the stethoscope on, and I was listening to my heartbeat. And I was like, wow, yeah, this is, this is it. This is, how, this is how it could work. Um, I'm, I'm hearing my heartbeat. I'm, I'm feeling it in real time. But I couldn't figure out how to, put the, how to put the device on me. And so I noticed, of course, necessity is the mother of invention, that she had left her, her bra on the floor. And so I thought, wow. Perfect. I'll just put the bra on. I'll put the stethoscope in there. And so I walked around San Francisco all day with, uh, with the stethoscope feeding my heartbeat back to myself. And uh, San Francisco is a cool city, so this is okay, but uh, just for one day. And uh, what that taught me was that actually there was something there that was quite interesting. And so we realized that technology, feeding your heart rate back to yourself, could be used in all types of applications, especially in psychological sciences. And so we figured out a way to to do that. And uh, we partnered with great psychiatrists now at Stanford and UCSF, and we're bringing a product to market. I've raised funding, and right now I, uh, I live in Shenzhen, China, building it, actually. And uh, we've, we've taken it to many different places uh, all over the world, and people are quite excited about it. But I'll show you my office and, uh, and then close here. So uh, there's all kinds of interesting people in China. This is, uh, this is one of them. Trolling and trying to kiss me right and dirty, 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 trying to kiss me right and dirty. Thank you very much for your time. Wait. Are you wearing it? Oh yeah, yeah. So he's so. wearing it right now. So that's <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs>